Hello, in this video we're going to talk about intracranial hemorrhage. Now, intracranial hemorrhage um, is a broad term because there are different types of hemorrhages that can occur within the skull. And so you can divide these types of hemorrhages in, broadly into extraaxial hemorrhage, meaning outside the brain tissue, and then you have intraaxial hemorrhage, which is within the brain tissue itself. Some examples of extra Axial hemorrhage include epidural, subdural, and subarachnoid hemorrhages. And then examples of intraaxial hemorrhage, meaning hemorrhages that occur within the brain tissue, include intracerebral hemorrhage and intraventricular hemorrhage. So now let's look at these different types of hemorrhages. Let's begin by first looking at the extraaxial hemorrhage. And Again, the definition is bleeding that occurs within the skull but outside the brain tissue. So let's look at the first example, which is epidural. An epidural hemorrhage is a hemorrhage that occurs um, essentially between the skull and the dura membrane. So here I am drawing a cross section. If you're, look, if you're looking straight ahead, we're cutting a section um, right, in, right through the head and we can see obviously the brain inside there with the brain stem and the cerebellum. Now, epidural hemorrhage occupies uh, the space between the scub skull and the dural membrane. So let's just revise the lay layers of the cranium now. So the layers of the cranium from the top is the scalp, which is you know your skin, um, subcutaneous fat, etc. And then you have the bone itself. And then you have the dura mater, the arachnoid membrane, the arachnoid space, the pia mater, and then you have the brain tissue itself. So again, an epidural hemorrhage occurs within the dura mater, the dura membrane, and the bone. Epidural hemorrhage often um, is a result of a trauma to the head. And so uh, about 70 to, to 70 to 95% of epidural hemorrhages um, present with skull fractures as well. Some examples, some causes of epidural hemorrhage include motor vehicle accidents, falls, and assault, such as, um, you know, a trauma to the head. Now, just to give some more information on epidural hemorrhages, the bleeding occurs uh, between the dura mater and the skull. The source of the blood itself is most often arterial, for example, from the middle meningeal artery. Clinical manifestations of an epidural hemorrhage include altered state of consciousness, headache, vomiting, confusion and seizures, as well as aphasia. So that was epidural hemorrhage. Now the next one is subdural hemorrhage. And as the name suggest suggests, it's a hemorrhage that occurs below the dura mater. So we're drawing the same diagram and we're zooming into this section here. And essentially the hemorrhage occurs between the dura mater and the arachnoid membrane. The causes of subdural hemorrhage are similar. They include motor vehicle accidents, falls and assaults. Now some more information on subdural hemorrhage. Bleeding is between the dura and the arachnoid membrane. The source of blood is often tearing of the bridging veins, so the source of blood is from the veins. Clinical manifestation of subdural hemorrhage are similar to those of epidural hemorrhage. Coma occurs in 50% of cases. Usually they have lucid interval which then leads to a progressive neuro a decline and then coma. The final type of extraaxial hemorrhage is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And as the name suggests, it's within the subarachnoid space. And usually, because it occurs in the subarachnoid space, the blood occupies the whole area, so you can actually engulf the whole brain in a way. So if we zoom into this area, we can see that the hemorrhage is within the subarachnoid space. And it's often a result of the cerebral artery, specifically um, an aneurysm within the artery. So the most common cause is rupture of a saccular type of aneurysm, and this would lead to a subarachnoid hemorrhage. A saccular, hem, uh, saccular em, um, aneurysm is essentially where you get this sac-looking thing uh, coming off the artery, 
and this it explodes, resulting in hemorrhage. Oh, of course, there are non-aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, but we won't talk about that, but it's just important to note. Now, some more information on subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, bleeding occurs within the arachnoid space. Source of blood is from rupturing of an aneurysm, and uh, most common is the cerebral arteries. The clinical manifestation of subarachnoid hemorrhage is similar to those that I mentioned earlier. However, one key point to make is that subarachnoid hemorrhage often um, occurs with a sudden severe headache, thunderclap headache. There's obviously also loss of consciousness, consciousness and potentially seizure, nausea, vomiting, and meningismus, which is essentially a triad of symptoms relating to um, irritation of the meninges. This include a um, stiff neck, photophobia, and one other thing which I cannot remember. So those were the three types of extra axial hemorrhage, epidural, subdural, and subarachnoid. Now let's look at extra axial hemorrhage, which as I mentioned in the beginning of the video is hemorrhage that occurs within the brain tissue. So an example is intracerebral hemorrhage. And some more, some sub examples are lobar hemorrhage. So um, hemorrhage that occurs in specific lobes of the brain. You can have thalamic hemorrhage. So hemorrhage that occurs within the thalamus. And then you can have pontine hemorrhage, hemorrhage that occurs in the pons, and also cerebella hemorrhage in the um, cerebellum. So some more information on intracerebral hemorrhage is that intracerebral hemorrhages is the second most common cause of stroke. The first most common cause of stroke is um, embolus or thrombus formation, atherosclerosis. The causes of intracerebral hemorrhage include hypertension, embolism, uh, brain tumor, bleeding disorders, and drug use. Clinical manifestations um, are, include you, the person possibly gets neurological signs and symptoms, uh, depending on the area affected, headache, nausea, vomiting, and decreased level of consciousness. Now, it's very important to realize that depending on where the hemorrhage occurs, so for example, the pons, this would result in some serious neurological signs and symptoms include problems with uh, breathing as well as heart rate because uh, it's this area, including the medulla, where our respiratory and cardiovascular centers are located. So, you know, so depending on where the hemorrhage occurs, that is where you'll get the neurological signs and symptoms. Now, the other type of intraaxial hemorrhage, which is basically within the brain tissue, is intraventricular hemorrhages. And essentially, it's bleeding within the ventricles of the brain. So bleeding is confined to the ventricle system of the brain, it most often occurs as a secondary phenomenon when intracerebral hemorrhage ruptures or when subarachnoid hemorrhage extends to the ventricles. So essentially, intraventricular hemorrhage is secondary to another hemorrhage such as, such as a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a intracerebral hemorrhage. So I hope this video made sense. Just to recap, intracranial hemorrhage includes hemorrhages that occur outside the brain tissue and hemorrhages that occur within the brain tissue. Some examples include epidural, subdural, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and then you also have intracerebral and intraventricular hemorrhage. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video.